So hi again everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel Fillers and Filters. Now of course I have the same makeup, I have the same look and I have the same get up but this is going to be another topic because of course it actually takes me an hour to fix my face. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yes, I'll let you into a little secret. Uh, I actually do not know how to link videos together. But of course, if you still haven't done it, it would actually be best if you also watch my previous video on the communication process. So that it would be easier for you to understand. Oh my God, that's my cat. Okay. So that it would be easier for you to understand these other videos or these succeeding videos that I'll be making. So in this episode, we'll be distinguishing the difference between nonverbal communication and verbal communication. Now we are already familiar with verbal communication so that when we say verbal communication, that means using words to communicate our thoughts, our ideas, or the information that we wanted to share. So, verbal communication may come in the form of written communication or spoken communication. Now, a lot of times, students are more likely to struggle with spoken communication or oral communication. Because what happens is that usually when you're writing or in written communication, you can actually pause and think. So you actually have time to gather your thoughts, jot down your thoughts, and organize them so that you can effectively convey your message. Now, a lot of second language learners of English would usually struggle with oral communication for several reasons now some of these reasons would be number one because you have uh, limited vocabulary and number two possibly because you have no idea what to say and thirdly it could be because of your lack of confidence now i actually have a previous video on how to be better in English. I think that I have produced already two videos. So number one is why do you speak better when you're drunk? Or uh, yeah, and the other one is uh, the learnings that I have uh, learned while learning English. <laughs> what? Okay, I mean the things that I have learned while I was learning my own all right, so the things that I have learned while I was learning English myself. So if you still haven't watched that, make sure that you watch them so that you may have uh, or you may gain insights or tips on how to improve your competence and your performance, that is. All right, so we have discussed verbal communication, but what now is nonverbal communication? Now, when we say nonverbal communication, that means we don't use words to express our feelings, our thoughts, the information we wanted to convey. But how do we do them? It could be through facial expression. It could be through gestures. It could be our space or our proximity towards another person. It could be how early or how, punctu how punctual we are in... Uh, in school or at work how we dress up how we put on makeup or how we prefer not to put makeup at all that would refer to nonverbal communication now what you would note is that all these things actually communicate something so even a mere ring on your ring finger could mean something well, at least uh, for myself, I don't have my wedding ring on, but um, I'm actually super duper proud to be <laughs> already married, to be a, a mother of uh, my two kids. So anyway, so all these things actually communicate something. So that uh, aside from trying to develop our spoken skills, it would also be 
good to develop our nonverbal communication. So that say for instance, when we are listening to another person, it would be nice if we nod our head in acknowledgement or it would be nice to smile. So smiling is also a form of nonverbal communication. If you're going to ask me, nonverbal communication is uh, something that's harder to improve simply because you usually do them unconsciously or should I say subconsciously you're half aware that you're actually doing it in my own experience whenever I ask students to perform a speech in front of uh, their classmates they would usually have mannerisms certain mannerisms like uh, you know playing with their ID or um, or doing something unnecessarily or they could be swaying okay so what you would note is that these are actually nonverbal signals and what do they signal they would usually signal shyness or an easiness they would usually signal lack of confidence lack of preparation and the like or some might have uh, completely memorized uh, their speech that when they deliver it in front of the class their expression would be blank so what you would note is that with the right hand gestures with the right facial expression with the right intonation with the right stress in your voice that is you could possibly help deliver your message better your verbal message better but before we talk about the different functions of nonverbal communication, let's try to find out what are other aspects or what other nonverbal signals can actually convey meaning. One, we have already established facial expression can be a powerful tool, can be a powerful nonverbal signal gestures it could be hand gestures okay so it could be posture so the way you carry yourself or the way you stand or the way you sit can communicate something it could communicate authority it can communicate lack of confidence or it could communicate lack of interest okay so when you're listening for instance So we have what we call paralanguage. Now when we say paralanguage, this refers to the different elements like for instance how fast you talk, so the speed or the rate of your speech, how loud your voice is could actually communicate something. But we also have the tone of your voice, so is it low, is it high pitch? If uh, the voice is loud, it's usually angry or excited or happy, okay? Or if the voice is soft, maybe sad or sleepy or bored, okay? For instance, if you're a news anchor or you're a um, host, okay, a TV host, they don't usually put people who speak low and slow in the morning slot because you're supposed to wake people up in the morning so set their mood make them energetic so you would usually have the likes of love and uh, who's that the other one um susan enriquez in unang hirit okay or winnie cordero in abs-cbn uh, umagang kay ganda so they would usually think about all these things depending on the time slot. But of course, if it's, uh, for instance, if you're a radio DJ on, uh, on the radio, they would usually slot those who have a very husky, relaxing voice, uh, um, very low and uh, modulated voice in the evening when people are supposed to be, you know, trying to get some sleep that is and of course the tone of your voice can also say something when i say tone is it monotonous is it the same from start to finish or is there a variety in the tones that you use now what you would notice that if uh, your voice is monotonous 
it's just flat from start to finish it's the same tone but you would notice that it doesn't cause excitement you wouldn't be able to capture the attention of your audience if you're just monotonous you'll basically bore your audience to death and you could possibly put them to sleep <laughs> Now, if you've been watching my videos for some time, you'd actually note that my mood is uh, sort of uh, different from my previous videos. Well, because I actually love the topic on nonverbal communication. Because once you're knowledgeable about these nonverbal signals, it's actually nice to try and analyze other people's nonverbal communication or nonverbal signals, that is. So, anyway. <laughs> but yes, moving on. Uh, we also have what we call proxemics. Now, from the term proximity, how close or how far you are from another person would entail something or would convey a certain meaning. Like you might have uh, a couple in the room, for instance, in the classroom that you have all been wondering about whether they are just friends or they are actually an item. That is because of proxemics, their closeness, physical closeness with one another, that is. So that uh, in a classroom setting, for instance, in uh, college classrooms where there is no seating arrangement, you'd actually already know from the first day of classes who belongs to a certain group of people or a certain barcada or clique, that is. S simply because they tend to stay together. And you would already know who are transferees, who are from another course, who is an international student, or who is not a part of the block, that is. So, simply because of proxemics. Alright, so also we have what we call chronomics, from the Greek word chronos, which means time. Okay, so you might have heard of words like chronology, which refers to period of time, that is. So when we say chronomics, this refers to the meanings that we can derive or that we can attach depending on uh, how a person uses his or her time. So that for instance, if we happen to have uh, a uh, classmate or if you happen to have a classmate who usually arrives uh, in class uh, late, have you ever experienced that? Now usually, what you would notice is that teachers are irritated by students who, are, who, who have the habit of arriving late. Why is that? Because uh, usually those who are supposed to be in higher position should have uh, more control of their time. So that for instance, you shouldn't make your teacher wait but the teacher can actually make you wait simply because he or she is of a higher status than you are. So that, for instance, the president of your company would ask you to report at 10 a.m. the following day. You don't go there at 10.15. You should be there maybe 5 minutes or 10 minutes before 10 o'clock, that is. Because usually those who are in a higher position would have more control of their time. So that uh, when you f violate that, or when you violate that rule, they would usually get offended because it's as if you're not respecting them. So do not be surprised if uh, next time your teacher will get mad at you for arriving late. But of course, it also it's important for you to arrive early because you don't know you might have a quiz or you might miss a part of the lecture which will make it harder for you to understand more complex topics that will be discussed later on that is and also we have what we call haptics haptics or tactile communication would refer to the use of touch in communicating now, have you ever wondered why 
there are instances where verbal communication is not enough. So suppose you have a broken-hearted friend who is crying. It actually wouldn't soothe her for you to just uh, talk and talk, okay? But perhaps a tap in the back or a gentle uh, rubbing of uh, her back or hugging her would actually make her feel better, okay? Now, that is what we call tactile communication. So, for instance, in the workplace, you might have heard of videos where they actually teach you how to do handshakes properly because that's part of tactile communication. The kind of handshake that you have or that you do would actually convey meaning. A sloppy and very loose handshake could mean disinterest, okay? Or it could mean you're, you don't want to do business with the other person, but the firm handshake would mean that uh, you're serious about your proposition or you actually wanted to do business with the other person or you want to establish a business relationship with the other party or the, with the other person that is. So again, that is what we call tactile communication or haptics. Other kinds of nonverbal signals could be eye contact. Okay, now eye contact is also a very powerful gesture when done properly. For you to become a good communicator, you need to learn how to maintain eye contact. So if you happen to be the sender or you are speaking in front of an audience, making eye contact with the, at least some of your audience can actually make them listen to you. Now, on the other hand, if you happen to be the receiver or you happen to be the audience, making eye contact can actually entail that you wanted to communicate, that you are listening attentively to what the other person is saying. And lastly, we actually have appearance. So it could be the clothes that you wear, the accessories that you have, which can communicate something. Now, now usually in a physical class, I would ask uh, students who have different uh, styles to stand in front of the class. And I would solicit impressions from the rest of the class. Now, usually, you form impressions based on how a person looks. So that, for instance, vloggers like me would actually have to dress up depending on the kind of uh, topics that we discuss. So that, for instance, I would actually make an effort to paint my face. Okay? I would actually make an effort to choose smart, casual clothes whenever I'm shooting my videos because the things that you wear, the accessories that you wear is actually a source of uh, meaning or could be artifacts that people would tend to interpret. But of course, I would like to discourage you from being judgmental or that is from being swayed with the physical appearance because uh, looks can be deceiving that is so regardless if the person looks uh, grubby or the person looks uh, unkempt or the person looks unhygienic or whatever you actually do not have the right to judge the other person if ever the other person prefers to style herself in a simple manner who are you to judge okay that's how she prefers to carry herself or he prefers to carry himself whenever I'm supposed to report in my class uh, when I did my masters I would actually make an eff effort to prepare so definitely I am prepared mentally so I actually know my topic that is I really put an effort to think about what I'm going to wear how I'm going to fix my makeup or what kind of background am I going to use in my slides that is because all of these things communicate something so that for instance you're the teacher 
and somebody rushes uh, comes in late and she was supposed to report that day so first she came in late that means well it's highly likely that she's not prepared and then she came came in class uh, you know looking unkempt so her hair is uh, in total disarray and the like so it's easy to judge the person that she is unprepared so whenever you have speaking engagements it would actually be best that you are not only prepared mentally but you are also prepared in other aspects especially fiscally that is so I'm not really I do not really require you to put on makeup but at least you look decent and you look uh, presentable that is but makeup do wonders <laughs> So I hope you have actually enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. So if you have questions, you have comments, insights, you wanted to share something, don't hesitate to jot them down in the comment section below. And of course, thanks again for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to my channel. And of course, up next would be the different functions of nonverbal communication. Au revoir!